Hello, and welcome to our next presentation. On behalf of the MIT CDOIQ Virtual Symposium, we'd like to thank all of our sponsors who have continued to support the symposium during this very challenging year. Before we thank our partners, we'd like to ask that sometime during the symposium's breaks that you visit our partners' virtual booths. You can also visit the content hub on the MIT CDOIQ website for some great partner resources. We'd like to thank the following partners, Deloitte, Informatica, Privacy and Analytics, Dowex, Fusion Alliance, KPNG, Sandal Consultants, Tamer, Alation, Ali Data, Big ID, Boomi, Caserta, Citizen, Data Kitchen, Garage, Okira, Pylog, Click, ThoughtSpot, Eckerson, Global IDs, Snowflake, Starburst. And as I said, please make every effort to visit our partners, use the virtual passport, because without them and our partner support, this symposium could not be held. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and welcome to day two. I actually got a couple of uh, slides that I'm just going to kick off and introduce the, the team and the presentation. So, bear with me here. Let's get this. So, uh, welcome to day two, opening remarks. Uh, I'm just going to take 30 seconds and just go through it. Uh, we've had, we asked you to make some noise, and you made some noise. Over a thousand, thousands of tweets have come in, uh, thousands and hundreds of, uh, well, I was going to say hundreds of thousands of posts, but thousands of posts have come in, all with the tag, hashtag MIT CDOIQ. Here's an example of one of the tweets that was posted there. We thank our attendees for making some noise. Uh, our keynote sessions, absolutely fantastic. We had over 900 people sign in and watch our keynote sessions, and then they divide it up into the four quadrants and watch the four panelists. And we have already received tremendous feedback, as we always do, on the fact that we've got great speakers and outstanding content. So we've got a special surprise for you. In the platform that we're using, because we're live streaming and we are recording, you are able to play back the uh, the recordings from yesterday. And I've noticed that there's a, a screen on the left over there, but it, if you go to any track, even the uh, keynote track, go to the top right hand corner, you will see a little uh, button there. If you click on that, it will then bring a list of the sessions that you can review. So if you're doing nothing in the evening or if it's very early in the morning, you wanna uh, catch up on a video you missed, which a lot of people tell us, you can click on the past to see the recording. So that's my catch up. Let me now go ahead and hand this over to the Executive Director of the International Society of Chief Data Officers, uh, Director Michael uh, Cervez, to uh, introduce the team and introduce the ISCDO Awards. Michael, let me pass it over to you. Robert. Robert, thank you very much for that. And uh, I'd like just to begin by thanking Rich, Robert, and the team for allowing the ISCDO this opportunity to kick off day two of what has been so far a really outstanding event, as always. Uh, for those of you who don't know us in the ISCDO, we are the child of the, uh, the MIT CDO IQ Symposium. A group of people led by uh, Rich Wang got together and felt that there was a need to carry on the, the movement, to carry on the, the benefits of the uh, symposium th throughout the year. And we formed a society uh, with that aim. We try to uh, provide webinars, papers, and uh, the ability to comment uh, for our members throughout the year, if you like to carry on the good work of the previous symposium and then to build us up uh, for the forthcoming symposium. Uh, we're a small, a small organization at the moment, growing, uh, run by volunteers. So if uh, you try and join and things don't happen uh, quickly enough, that's because the volunteers have got a, a day job as well. And uh, we're developing the services that, that, that we produce. Now, one of the things that we like to do in the uh, society is to, is to reward excellence and to reward excellence in data specifically. And to do that, uh, I've been very lucky to have uh, Dr. James Meng and his trusted team of, uh, of volunteers, more volunteers, uh, who come together each year to look for 
some individuals that they can uh, award with uh, what, uh, well, you'll see what, what, what they get, so, uh, just a, a small mark of recognition of the excellence that they have produced in transforming data, in using data uh, to gain value and benefit uh, for their organizations. And James and his team put an enormous amount of effort going through endless uh, uh, bits of uh, information about uh, these people to sort of whittle away a large uh, list of uh, potential candidates to come up with uh, their worthy winners. Uh, so James, before I hand over to you, thanks very much to you and your team. Another great job uh, from you this year. So Robert, if we can, if we can hand over to James, uh, who will uh, lead us in the next bit. Good morning. Thank you, Michael, for that uh, wonderful introduction. This is a really wonderful day for the award committee to share with you the progress we have made um, uh, for this uh, award. So I'd like to go ahead and share the slides. Uh, everybody can see that? Yep, coming through loud and clear. Thanks, James. Super. Uh, this is the second time we do the Transformation Award um, ceremony, and uh, the first one was in 2017. And um, actually, one of the awardee was, uh, um, uh, is also uh, present at uh, in our meeting here today. Um, the purpose of the award are to recognize outstanding CEOs for their achievements, um, as well as acknowledge and their innovative approaches, especially recognize their courageous trials despite uh, failures. Uh, those are the key things all the CEOs are facing. We especially like uh, like to uh, uh, bring those effects to the community uh, to let them know and therefore uh, you should not be CDOs, you should not be discouraged. And the third is to recognize and encourage uh, early adopters, innovators, and especially the young data expert uh, professionals. This is a particular area we have um, uh, not made uh, uh, enough uh, progress, we would encourage more early adopters and uh, don't be uh, 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 too humble uh, not uh, apply for the nomination. And also re uh, recognize a recent appointment, especially those who have the power to influence the public perception and the thought leadership and those taking on bold initiatives despite the very limited uh, resources. At this uh, point of a pandemic, and this is especially a point that I uh, would like to uh, uh, encourage a nomination. And the committee um, is a form of entirely volunteers, uh, really uh, uh, with a lot of help from uh, other uh, big data um, um, uh, innovators and uh, uh, pr practitioner. Uh, Ms. Corey Brack from SAP, she is a senior director for enterprise information management product and marketing. Mr. Dan Everett, she, uh, he is a VP from Informatica. Mr. Tina Tan, and she founded the, uh, she's a co-founder for Women in Big Data, Inc. Uh, this is actually a very, very useful uh, initiative. And we need to encourage more women uh, participate. And Mr. Dennis uh, met in, He's the head of uh, data strategy uh, uh, in the uh, RELX group uh, of ICIS. Dr. Peter Lin uh, here, Lin here, uh, VP from uh, Calibra, uh, and also uh, uh, Mr. Robert Lutton and Mr. Michael Servius uh, being coaching, uh, supporting us all the way through the process. And uh, myself is a senior scientist at the uh, UCSD uh, supercomputer uh, center. Uh, the first the category, we have uh, three categories awards uh, for transformation, uh, data transformation. The first one is for transformation of collaboration from inwards to outwards. 
this award recognized the outstanding business outcomes from the performance of CDOs who have demonstrated tangible outcomes as a result of efforts in the collaboration uh, direction uh, dimension, in other words, from inwards versus outwards. Though the, uh, the direction dimension uh, reference to the original paper by Rich Wen uh, and Yan Li and all um, uh, about uh, uh, 10 years ago, it really laid down the fundamentals of the data transformation um, uh, elements. And uh, this uh, particular direct uh, uh, access inwards to outwards uh, has been um, uh, uh, applied for this transformation award. The criteria for award um, winners is those evidence. Uh, first one is a bottom line impacts on business mission outcomes. It uh, has evidence on improved trustworthiness and the timeliness of the data and the improved data governance as well as enterprise support within and outside organization. And uh, we have uh, three um, nominees um, in, um, in this category. Uh, uh, Shri Mishra from JDRF, Carlos Rivero from uh, Commonwealth of uh, Virginia is a state um, uh, a CDO. And Althea Jacqueline Davis, uh, she's a founder of Data Governors Group from AEN AMRO Insurance uh, of uh, uh, Holland, uh, Netherlands. And the winner in this category of um, transformation collaboration from inwards to outward is Mr. Shui Mishra. He's the Chief Data and Technology Officer, JDRF uh, International. I'm going to stop sharing and uh, allow he, uh, Mr. Shri Mishra to show up and then I'm going to share again to show his uh, slides. Hi, Dr. Meng, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So first of all, Dr. Meng, thank you. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the award committee um, at ISCDO. We are really honored. I'm really honored and humbled. And I just want to, uh, this award would have been possible without my team and the support I got from JDRF. So I've got uh, three, I mean, there are four things I would like to quickly cover. One, just to give a brief overview of what does JDRF do. Uh, then we'll go and look at the, what is the business problem that we try to solve, as you just mentioned earlier through data and technology. Uh, how did we do it from inwards to out outwards? Uh, so we'll look at the problem statement and the solution, and then we look at the key outcomes. Okay, let me uh, share the slides. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, uh, um, uh, this is uh, uh, Mr. Mishirat holding the trophy, and I would like to take a few minutes to just uh, read here the citation for him on uh, winning this award. The citation to Mr. Sri Mishra, Chief Data and Technology Officer, JDRF International, the winner of ISCDO 2020 Award in Transformation of Collaboration, from inwards to outwards. Changing from point to point to API driven architecture for data and the process integration to a modular enterprise architecture linking JDRF financial system with a fundraising systems online all through middleware, you have accomplished a centralized master data management, a single consistent definition for data, structured workflow, Automation enabled have resulted in employee trust in data and collaboration. JDRF data analyst improved the one on one support to families, including insulin delivery and the cost reductions during the COVID 19 pandemic. True to JDRF's mission of improving lives, your data transformation has successfully applied the data and the analytics to help 
people live uh, happier lives. I'm going to turn to your slides. Thank you. Over. Thank you, James. So very quickly, uh, I just thought I would start with what, what, what does JDRF do? So JDRF stands for Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. We are the leading global organization and the area we support is in type one diabetes. So there are two kinds of diabetes. One, what we call as type two, where people get that uh, because of the bad food, uh, health habits and all that. And that is curable. And then there is type one, which he can hit anyone. It's basically an autoimmune disease and it can hit anyone where the pancreas stops insulin. So that could lead to a lot of complications. Uh, I mean, there could be organ failure and could also lead to death. This can happen to children or, and to adult. So our vision is to be a world without type one diabetes. Um, we have funded nearly $2 billion of research so far, and we are continuing the fight uh, on type 1D. In terms of the community of people that we are working with, it's roughly around 1.6 million type 1D diabetes in the United States, and there are 20 million across the world. So we serve, this is our community that we serve. These are our customers. These are our supporters. And, uh, you know, across the world, there are 20 million people. So... The, um, James, if we can go to the next slide. So our, our goal is how could JDRF as a nonprofit leverage connected data and technology uh, architecture to drive our mission? Um, and there are, you know, um, like any for-profit company where you have customers, nonprofits also we call them as our supporters. And these supporters could be donors who raise money for us, and that resources get transmitted into the research that we do across major universities like Stanford and in, uh, in, in UCLA and all the other places. But the key idea is how do we know these supporters? And as I was just highlighting earlier, there could be like donors who raise donations. There could be advocates. So advocates are people who you know, advocate the mission and work, for example, with the government to reduce the price of insulin working with the insurance companies. So there could be multiple personas of the supporters. There could be donors, there could be advocates, there could be volunteers, and there could be researchers. So the idea is how do we know who our supporters are and how can we engage with them? And all that is not possible without having a connected data. So on top of that, we uh, our goal was if we have to accelerate the mission, we need to increase the growth funnel. So that means how do we capture leads? How do we acquire them? How do we engage with them? And how do we retain our supporters? And the, the, the third major pillar that we were solving, the, the business problem we are solving is how can we ensure there is personalization? So, uh, and how do we personalize based on who our supporters are and based on their preferences. So for example, a millennial uh, person could be more engaged on social channels, whereas uh, the person in the senior age, we, email could be the right platform. So how do we reach to the right supporters on the right device, so the right channel, so that we can drive engagement? And then there is data analytics and how do we automate our processes? So I just wanted to highlight, I know uh, we have a very short window, but just wanted to let this community, I mean, <clears throat> there's this audience know that you know, the key mission we wanted to do was how do we leverage data fully to drive our mission to find a cure for type 1D as, as soon as possible. So, uh, James, if we can go to the next slide. So, <clears throat> in this particular slide, I would like to highlight, you know, how we could come to a, you know, what, what was the technical challenge and how, what is the solution with that we put in place. So our challenges were, again, not completely different from any other company. There were multiple systems. Uh, they were not, they were connected point to point. There was no data governance. There was no standard data flow. Um, uh, and, you know, there were a lot of time was spent on manual work. So the idea was how can we get to a more modular, modern, connected, and architecture so that, you know, the systems are connected and we could go to the, uh, you know, we could reach our mission as I was highlighting the earlier slide. So to do that, the, the, the few steps we took was just to break uh, data into incoming data, 
the connected data. It's like typical data flow. And then how could we measure outcomes? So all the data, like for example, we had multiple fundraising system. We have web data, we have social data, we have donor data, uh, we have our first party data. So we connected all that into, uh, into our CRM. And we also connected our, our transactional data, like our finance system, HR system, you know, our people systems, all of them through middleware, through business rules. In that way, uh, we could put data governance in place. And we, on top of that, we put master data management to ensure the data we have is continuously mastered. And in the next slide, I'm gonna highlight like what are the outcomes, but for, for the, just, uh, and in terms of what we had uh, is, you know, the first thing we could achieve is efficiency because we had this multiple systems, people were spending a lot of time on, on manual work, getting the data, and then at the end of it, the, the data was not clear. So we could achieve around, as you can see in the slide, around 30 to 40% efficiency moving from a point to point to a connected API microservices driven architecture. Uh, in terms of the master records, um, um, you know, we had a lot of duplicates, the data were not properly mastered. It's a typical problem uh, when people face when they're building their first party infrastructure. So we had around 12 to 13 million records and we, because of master, mastering them and, and putting proper data governance in place, we had you know 70% 70, 70 reduction, but we got the real golden records that we could use to engage with our customers, uh, with, our, with our supporters. And then on top of that, because the accuracy level increased and uh, the people, the, you know, all our field employees, all our uh, chapter employees were, were, were running and spending a lot of time in cleaning the data, that dropped to 20 to 30%. In that way, the marketing team could focus on marketing work. The sales teams could focus on the sales work. The advocacy team could focus on the sales advocacy work versus spending a lot of time on data cleansing. Now, in terms of the organization-wide benefits, so now that we have clean data, we knew who our customers are, we know what their preferences is, we could engage with them much better. Earlier, the way we were engaging was we're just uh, you know, throwing our uh, stories or ads and we're hoping it's gonna stick, but now clearly knowing who are, who are, who are the people that we're engaging, we could do more personal-based marketing, um, engage marketing and relationship engagement. So that increased, so as you can see the number there. So our click through rates went up, our conversions rates went up, uh, our donation also went up. And I'll just quickly highlight a very immediate quick uh, case, use case. So when we first cleaned the data, we found out there were a million donors that we had never engaged with. So they had engaged with us uh, two to three years back, but nothing happened after that. So we could re-engage with them and that could we could add $600,000 that we put the, into our research to find a cure for T1D. Again, this the whole organization is not just on donors or uh, you know revenue. I just wanted to highlight the personal side of it. Look, if, if, in, a, if in a fam family, uh, a new mom and dad found uh, find out that the child has T1D, they're completely devastated because uh, it takes a lot of effort to keep the insulins on, on, on the right level. Otherwise it could cause serious complications. So the big help we're looking for is, uh, uh, is, is how do we ensure that if, how do we reach to the right, uh, our, let's say a, a new parent has identified a child with, with, uh, with type 1D, how can we quickly send a volunteer or a healthcare professional to reach and talk to them and help them to do that. So uh, with the clean data earlier, what used to happen was identifying, like the parents used to go to a website and identifying a volunteer or a healthcare provider nearer, near to them took time because all of our data, our infrastructure were not connected. So we never knew who had asked the request and all that. Now that we have centralized, we have put data governance, we have put data cleansing, we have connected the systems together. Now, if a new parent identifies that they have a kid or uh, we can immediately match with them uh, and uh, volunteer very near. So moving from uh, earlier to take 10, 10 days, now it takes 24 to 48 hours. So that has uh, that has helped us to serve our T1D community better. On top of that, we are also working with the government, with our advocates to help reduce the insulin price. And as you all know, COVID-19 has been a huge disruptor 
and we are moving towards a more digital world. So these important things for, for, for the folks who have the disease, so the folks who are trying to help to, to find a cure of the disease, this data and technology infrastructure, you know, has really helped us to be, you know, strong inwards, but our goal is to help outwards. So, um, you know, this, uh, I, I just, uh, this is a, um, what I'm trying to say is the infrastructure that we've put in is not just solving a business problem, but we want to serve the society. And this is a real use case of how a, uh, how a nonprofit has leveraged data and technology to reach the core constituency so that we can find and solve the, uh, you know, the T1D issue that we have. And this use case could be replicated to the other nonprofits. Um, so with that, I would like to thank Dr. James, Dr. Meng for the opportunity and for the award. The whole team at JDF is, uh, is really honored, sir. Congratulations, really appreciate your summary. The second category is award for transformation from traditional data to big data. Uh, this award recognizes outstanding business outcomes from the performance of CDOs who have demonstrated tangible outcomes as a result of efforts in the data space dimension from traditional data versus big data. The criteria uh, for the winners are impact on the business uh, mission outcome, improved the trustworthiness, timeliness of data, and the data, big data processing integration capabilities, and they improved the big data analytics uh, capabilities. And this year we have uh, two uh, nomination uh, for this, competing for this. Uh, Mr. Derek Strauss uh, from TD Ameritrade and also Alicia Jacqueline Davis uh, from ING Bank Dutch. And the winner is Mr. Derek Strauss, Chief Data Officer for TD Ameritrade from 2012 to 2016. And I'm going to stop sharing Derek, take over. Thanks very much. Thanks very much and good morning, everyone. And uh, again, thank you for the honor of uh, receiving this award. Um, you know, as the previous speaker also mentioned, a lot of it goes to the team always. And, and I do have a slide later on that will show the team. Uh, we started from scratch. I mean, there, there was no chief data officer, there was no uh central capability around analytics and, and data for the firm and so it was a really from zero base uh kind of uh, effort that we that we implemented um this capability so um i think perhaps the the best would be you know in the interest of time uh, just to jump sure. across into the into the slides okay congratulations Derek. thank you Uh, let me read the citation to Mr. Derek Strauss, Chief Data Officer, TD Ameritrade, uh, 2012 to 2016. The winner of ISCDO 2020 award in transformation from traditional data to big data. You established TD Ameritrade's big data ecosystem, the data marshalling yard to provide a foundation for greater volume, velocity, in the variety of data. Common staging area, data quality checks, masking of sensitive data and the inexpensive archival. Resulting improved efficiency and the ease of operations enabled real-time data-driven decisions and the prompt leadership to accept big data for insights. You're transforming from transactional data to big data differentiated TD Ameritrade in improved anti-money laundering, know your customer fraud investigation, stress testing and the scenario analysis, as well as enabled real-time model-driven 
retail risk assessment and the market surveillance. Congratulations, Derek, please take over. Thanks very much uh, once again, and, and let's jump straight into the next slide. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, we started from scratch, literally, and uh, and some of you might be scratching your head at this point in time as well and saying, well, okay, this was 2012 to 2016, it was a period of five years, so those are inclusive years there. Um, five years, uh, and why are we now in 2020 only starting to look back at this? Well, you know, simple answer to that. There are a couple of people, leaders that I've always admired in my, my life. Um, two of them, in fact, were leaders at um, TD Ameritrade. The one was the chief executive officer and the other was the chief operating officer. Um, chief executive officer was Fred Tomzik and uh, Marv Adams was the uh, chief operating officer. And uh, the message from both of them to me was, Derek, the true mark of success uh, is, were you able to fundamentally change the organization, not just whilst you're in office, not just whilst the initial change is happening, but years afterwards, what does it look like? Can you still see the footprints of, uh, you know, what you and your team were doing in what is happening currently in the organization? So, you know, in 2020 gives us an opportunity to literally use 2020 vision, look backwards and see, you know, what has survived, what has continued to be used by the organization. And certainly this aspect of the move from transitional data to big data is something that has stood the test of time and credit goes to the team. So just kind of briefly introducing the team um, Jeff Gentry, uh, and this is in no order of, of importance, by the way. <laughs> these, these are all uh, critical components uh, of the team, critical roles and, and key individuals, individuals that really stepped up and um, uh, stood shoulder to shoulder to make this work, because it was a big, big culture change <laughs> to the organization. Um, so, Jeff Gentry, the, the Director of Data Governance, Eric Leidick, the Enterprise Data Architect, Jim Kevens, the Director of Data Management, Hamid Benbrahim, the Chief Data Scientist, uh, Lat Munson, the Director of Business Intelligence and Analytics, and Krishna Sama, uh, the Director of Data Development. So, so when I started at TD Ameritrade, we were just doing really traditional data. Traditional data was all that we were focused on and it was account-based data, it was transactions um, and, and great work had been done. It was all sitting in the teaser, on the teaser platform. There was a, a, an enterprise data warehouse there. There was also an exploration warehouse. Um, and as I say, a lot of great work was being done. However, um, there were a number of constituents in the business who were saying, yeah, this is good, but we want more. You know, we want the ability to really get into uh, big data. And so we, we spent the first 90 days um, working with senior leadership team, trying to identify use cases where big data would be useful. And we came up with, with several uh, very interesting uh, possibilities. Three of them were around client intimacy. <laughs> they were looking at enhanced customer segmentation, customer retention issues, and social media analysis. And we, we proceeded to uh, do a couple of POCs in those areas to try and make sure that we uh, could kind of prove out the concepts around it and make sure that these were viable opportunities. And we wrote up the results of the proof of concepts. But in parallel to that, uh, we had a lot of interest um, from the risk community in the business. And the risk community was saying to us, 
you know, we really need to understand retail risk assessment. Uh, it, it's an area where we've already got some really good capabilities, but we need a whole lot more. Uh, we need also institutional counterparty exposure, um, you know, capabilities. And again, you know, our, our current environment on the teaser is great, but you, we're going to run out of runway there pretty quickly, and we're going to need more. Uh, likewise, uh, the AML and uh, fraud um, area for our compliance and fraud people uh, became a spotlight for us to look at. And, and likewise, also market surveillance um, for the compliance and fraud folks. So here we had, you know, six or seven key areas, use cases that just popped straight up. The business community was all gung ho. Let's go for this. Let's create ourselves a, a, an environment where we can really start focusing on big data. But guess where the biggest resistance was? <laughs> Information technology. Yes. Information Technology Group was saying, you know, we've been very successful as an organization to this point, just focusing on traditional data. Why do we need all this big data stuff? We don't need it. And the architects on the information technology front in the community in particular were dead against it, dead against it. There was huge resistance. So uh, it was a fascinating, um, fascinating situation, which took us frankly, a year to work through uh, to actually start changing the culture to a point where we were able to start really making progress. And we, our initial implementation of the big data environment, we, we chose Hortonworks and we had Hadoop environment of 24 nodes, 750 terabytes, you know, with a one in three replication. Uh, and within that environment, we, we really got to work around, you know, bringing in chat data, emails, uh, client account information, clickstream information, um, you know, Adobe site catalysts, uh, you know, web uh, data, client content history of, of uh, interactions with clients and uh, started really assembling a lot of very good data the the community that really stepped up and pushed and and gave the greatest support was actually the uh, the risk community and if we can go to the next slide please uh, what we did from an architectural perspective was we created a data marshalling yard we, we shied away from this term data lake because frankly, I couldn't sell a data lake to the, the, the C-suite, uh, my colleagues in the C-suite um, of TD Ameritrade. Uh, a marshalling yard was more of an engineering approach where you would have persistent staging, you'd have exploratory analytics, you'd have various pieces of this that were carefully structured. And we spent about six months really doing a, a really great architectural job of um, figuring out how this data marshalling yard would work uh, and creating a really robust uh, architecture for it. If we can jump to the next slide. One of the key things we did was the top part of this diagram essentially depicts um, our Netiza environment, which was kind of structured along the DW 2.0 um, architecture. The bottom half shows how we added the data marshalling yard to the picture, where we use the data mar marshalling yard as persistent staging and also as enterprise archival, but also a place where we could hook up um, the application access, application access to things like um, GenPact's uh, risk canvas for the risk team so that we could do real-time um, risk analytics. Uh, and so that became the first, the initial thrust 
uh, that brought business value to the enterprise and ultimately brought our technology community around to giving support to this as well. So that's, that's the end of my, uh, my story. And I think I made it just inside the 10 minute limit that we set. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it again. Um, uh, congratulations. Thank you. The third category is our work for transformation of a value impact from data service to business um, uh, strategy. This award recognizes the outstanding business outcomes for, from the performance of CDOs who have a demonstrated tangible outcomes as a result of efforts in the transformation of a value impact from data service to business strategy. The um, evidence of the impact on business mission outcomes improved the trustworthiness and timeliness of data, improved the strategic insights and evidence of broad-based utilities viewed by stakeholders. This were the uh, criteria uh, when the award committee used to score the uh, nominees. And uh, we have uh, five nominees in this category. Uh, Mr. Marcus Rem, uh, he's a VP in data analytics uh, governance uh, from Scheffler AG, Germany. Uh, Michael Conlon is the Chief of Business Analytics Officer from Department for Defense. Uh, Mr. Derek Strauss uh, from TD Ameritrade. And Sri Mishra is the CDO and CTO from JDRF. And Althea Jacqueline Davis. And uh, she is, she was, she is leader golden master data quality for poll finding for Hennigan and it had a United Arab uh, Emirate. And the winner is Mr. Michael Collin, Chief Business Analytics Officer Defense of um, the Department for Defense. I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, Michael uh, going to be shown on the screen. Congratulations, Michael. Thank you, Dr. Meng. It's really, uh, I feel incredibly fortunate to be among the company today. The accomplishments that Sri Mishra talked about at JDRF and the accomplishments that Derek Strauss talked about at TD Ameritrade are so impressive. It's just humbling to be considered in the same grouping as those award winners. Um, and I am, just, I just uh, can't believe my, my good fortune. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to be here and to be considered, uh, let alone to receive this award. Okay, so I'm gonna start sharing. And let me read the citation to Mr. Michael Collin, Chief Business Analytics Officer, Department of Defense. The winner of ISCDO 2020 Award in Transformation of Value Impact from Data Service to Business Strategy. You have established the new Advena, the Defense Repository of a Common Enterprise Data to transform data into common schemas across the business domains. You sought to integrate data, not systems, with all process steps accompanied by a comprehensive audit trail. Advana now serves users with a seamless experience of full data journey to getting insights. High accuracy, completeness, uh, completeness and a faster processing time reduce the DOD data processing errors and the rework. Robotic process automation, automated manual, time intensive tasks. He enabled the data quality assessment in data pipeline and audit by third party. DOD workforce now uses Advana to identify realignment 
and the reprioritization opportunities and to identify cost savings opportunities. All DOD investments and initiatives are aligning with the mission and the intent of business and users. The DOD's top executives now demand real-time data for decision-making and data has become a DOD enterprise asset to drive policy and decision-making and shared to optimize value. It's really a gigantic uh, accomplishment. Congratulations, Michael. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think that it's, um, it's, uh, it's important for me to talk about some elements of this. Uh, we'll start with the uh, results that we were able, or the, sorry, the context within which we operated. Um, when I joined the department uh, you know, two years ago as the first chief data officer, we did not have a culture of data-centered decision-making. We had a culture of experience-centered decision-making, and we were relying on 35-year-old techniques and tools for data engineering and, and data analysis. Um, but some things created a context where that was no longer going to be good enough for the department. And foremost among those was a new national defense strategy. And it spelled out some really important shifts in priority. The first of those shifts uh, was that we now saw great power competition as more important to the mission of the department than the counterinsurgency uh, fight that we have been in for the better part of the last two decades. And great power competition isn't just about the, um, the Department of Defense, it's not just about the uh, federal government, it's about the entire United States being in competition with other nation states. Uh, and therefore, for the department, there are some very clear shifts that accompany that new focus on great power competition. First, we have to start optimizing the entire Department of Defense, the whole ecosystem. And our history has been all about emphasizing and optimizing the individual component parts and their performance, because we push authority down as close to responsibility as possible in the organization. And so authority is actually quite distributed. Um, and therefore people were making decisions to optimize their piece, their component of the organization. It became critical that we enable ecosystem performance to be the priority over individual component performance. And when you have roughly 10,000 operational IT systems around those components, even creating a view to ecosystem performance was a non-trivial exercise. Um, we wanted to shift away, deliberately shift away from experience under decision-making. And um, not that we don't value experience, we do. It's incredibly important. But what we want to do is make those experienced decision makers more productive, more effective uh, in their decision making process by providing them with data and analytics to guide those uh, decisions that they make uh, and to increase the quality and the um, timeliness of that data. Um, we also want to move away from an old process of executive decision making that relied on this thing we call a data call and, and most organizations experience some element of this at some time an executive identifies a new issue um, nobody has the data to help inform a decision so you send out emails you make phone calls and you ask all kinds of folks to generate um, various forms of data information for you you might spend six weeks getting it all in you might spend six more weeks just trying to crunch it into something that's common so you can add it all up, right, and stack it. And then you might spend another six weeks of reviews up and down the chain to make sure that it's all correct. And now you're making a decision on content that's four months old. Uh, we wanted to go to real-time oversight in the department, real-time oversight of the operations and management of the Department of Defense. Or as the phrase we use in the National Defense Strategy, um, data at the speed of relevance. Uh, and, and this was a, a significant set of challenges when they brought me in. Um, and as you see at the bottom, some of the direct impact that we were able to have by creating not only the infrastructure, the set of tools in the data sandbox, 
uh, and the analytics, but also the cultural change that goes with that. We were able to deliver some significant performance improvements that directly map to the priorities of the Secretary of Defense. Um, and and uh, you can see I'm citing uh, $35 billion, more than $35 billion in improved financials in a range of different areas, massive budget shifts to realign to the national defense strategy as specifically driven by the Secretary of Defense, uh, improvements in cost reduction and, and improved affordability in a range of areas of both cost savings and cost avoidance. Um, and we, we refer here to expiring funds. This has always been an issue in the federal government. The Congress gives you money uh, and then expects you to spend that money. People tend to be a little bit risk averse and so they hold that back and the funds uh, expire at, the, at a given date. They have a use by date. And then they're lost. You, you can no longer spend them on national defense since we're trying to bring down the amount of expiring funds. Uh, and so all of these benefits that we were able to deliver as validated by the Comptroller's organization, not, not mine, but by the Comptroller, um, are uh, reflective across a, the so-called five years defense plan or fit up. Um, and all of those realigned monies, all of those cost avoidances, all went to the line of effort one of the national defense strategy, which is improved um, readiness and improved lethality. So direct contributions to the mission of the department. Could, could we uh, just go to the next slide, please? All right. Um, th these are some of the, the sub areas that uh, you can see where we were able to marshal evidence, um, business mission outcomes. That's all about improved affordability and performance of the business processes in the department. And we spend hundreds of billions of dollars managing finances, human resources, IT, real estate, logistics and supply chain, the same business functions that almost every organization has. Uh, improving the trustworthiness and the timeliness of the data. And I talked about speed of relevance and providing strategic insights in terms of how our programs and projects aligned with the national defense strategy or in need of realignment with the national defense strategy. And the critical thing in the end was that we generated a large number of utilities that are viewed by stakeholders across the department. And, th and that's critical. To get there, teamwork was everything um, because those stakeholders all had different points of views. And so one of the first things I did when I joined the department was form a partnership between the Office of the Chief Management Officer that I serve and the Comptroller's organization. And the partners, uh, uh, we ended up forming a virtual team. So I have a number of data practitioners in my directorate, and then there are teammates over in the Comptroller's organization, incredibly important to me, Mark Easton, Doug Glenn, Greg Little. Um, then there are a very a variety of data officers across the department in specialty areas like acquisition, Mr. Mark Crisgo. Um, and then there are the military department chief data officers who were important partners of mine. Tom Sasala, Chief Data Officer of the Navy. Eileen Vadreen, Chief Data Officer of the Air Force. Greg Garcia, Chief Data Officer of the Army. And the chap who replaced me as the overall Chief Data Officer, now reporting to the CIO, Mr. David Spur. All really great partners, all helped us accomplish this impact that I've been telling you about today. And to get there, it was all about changing the culture to a culture of evidence-based decision-making. This is a key phrase in government, by the way, right now, evidence-based decision-making. That's data statistically validated and statistically analyzed for insights. And, and it's been that success that led to my new role, which is the chief business analytics officer, um, which is all about delivering those insights now that we've got the data. But the way we got the data was to create a really important data sandbox and analytical environment called Advana. So if we could go to the last slide, we'll show you a quick look at Advana. Uh, and this is just the top level view. In my, in my remarks yesterday afternoon, I shared what the underlying tech stack looks like. But you can see the breadth and depth of the types of data feeds we've got, all live data feeds, live analytics, um, served up in specific domains for specific audiences and now used in the senior most decision-making fora in the Department of Defense. 
Uh, I owe all of the credit to my partners. They made me look good, and I want to thank them and the stakeholders, and I will stop there. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, congratulations again. Uh, now I'm going to stop uh, sharing. Um, and um, just a remind, please uh, join us. Let's see. Stop sharing. Uh, is it possible, Robert, to have uh, all the awardees shown together once? So let's simulate the um, state standing on the stage and receive applause. <laughs> That's a good idea. So why don't we, uh, if uh, uh, Mr. Mishra, uh, Mr. Colin, and uh, Mrs. Strauss, if you all turn your cameras on and everyone else turn your cameras off, uh, then that way, uh, uh, Barry, can we go into multiple panel role and sort of get the uh, picture of the uh, three awardees? And uh, we'll just uh, wait for uh, Michael Conlon. Can you turn on your camera? Oh, uh, I thought I turned it on. Yes, yeah, Michael's there. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so those are the three awardees uh, on behalf of the International Society of Chief Data Officers, and also on behalf of the MIT CDO IQ Symposium. We would like to congratulate, in order, Ms. Misha, Mr. Strauss, and Mr. Conlon for outstanding achievements and contributions to the Chief Data Officer Program Society and uh, Symposium. So, thank you very much indeed. So, round of applause. <clears throat> uh, Thank let, you. Me, uh, uh, let me just uh, suggest uh, one more. Uh, my co-service, Robert, yourself, myself, and also Ms. Maria Villa, if you're still there, because she was the first uh, time winner of uh, the award. So we got a few minutes. If we can show as a common picture, sim simulate that we all were staging on together for a photo. Is that possible? So we have a record. It is being recorded for prosperity. So uh, thank you all to the uh, attendees and uh, to the uh, respondents and the awardees and the winners and everyone who uh, registered. And I think, Michael, uh, why don't I leave you with the, the last minute or two to uh, make any kind of uh, announcements on the, uh, the uh, International Society of Chief Officers. We'll give that time to you. Oh, but thank, uh, thanks, uh, James, uh, Derek, Shree, and Michael. Well done. Uh, yeah. good, good to see you, if not in person, but uh, over the airwaves. Uh, it's been a long time, Derek. Uh, uh, congratulations. I hope uh, we haven't set the bar too high there for, for next year with, with three uh, very worthy winners. Looking forward to it. I hope uh, that the people who have been watching will be, uh, you know, scribbling down uh, James Meng's email address, look at, looking to put uh, people forward for next year for uh, the, the awards so that, you know, we can get in early, get a good bunch of people in and, and really get some worthy win winners out. For the society, I've got two minutes. We're going ever onwards, increasing our, uh, the, the depth of our relationship with uh, the symposium. We're now a partnership with CDO magazine. I think uh, if you're not if you're not a uh, a member, it might be worth having a look. It might be worth seeing what we can uh, all share amongst each other to make our jobs better, to make the value that we give to the organisations we work with uh, greater. So, Robert, thanks very much. Thanks to you, Rich, and the team for putting this on. It's been fabulous. Thank you're you. Welcome, Thank Mike. you. And there was a lot of. Uh, Sorry, James, go ahead. No, thank you all, especially Robert and uh, Michael, your support. And congratulations to the three winners again. Excellent. Over. Thank you, guys. And uh, Michael, I don't think it was on the last slide, but I think the uh, website name is iscdo.org. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank uh, everyone. It is uh, a quick bio break. So our next session is going to be at 1015. So you've got time to get a copy of UFO and come back for the next exciting session. Thank you, we look forward to seeing you. If our team will just stay on the line till we uh, close out. Thank you.